Hello and welcome to Moving On. I'm Leslie Miller, your host, and tonight our show is about Dr. Dave Dobson and his concept other than conscious communication. Dave Dobson comes from Friday Harbor, Washington in this weekend to do a two and a half day training. He's a psychotherapist and a hypnotherapist and this weekend is going to be on talking about other than conscious communication and no fault psychology. Dave, I'd like to know a little bit more about uh, your explanation of other than conscious communication. I am a student and have participated in many of your seminars. Maybe you can give me a little more information about other than conscious communication. Maybe. Maybe not. I think it's only fair to these people out that may be watching this to let them know that we have no script and we're just going to wing it. And um, yeah, I'll tell you about other than conscious communication. The I actually came up with the terminology for it about 1970 because I uh, I was still in practice in those days as a hypnotherapist in California. And I really don't like the term hypnosis because so many people uh, either use it as a cop-out or afraid of it, one or the other. Mm -hmm. They use it as a cop-out because they, they expect a hypnotist to do something for them or to them. They use it as a cop-out also to say they're afraid of it. And after working with thousands of people, I'm convinced that there is no such thing as hypnosis, and everything's hypnosis. Probably the greatest hypnotist in the world is your mother and your daddy mm -hmm. and your school teachers and your favorite uncle, your priest, your rabbi. These are people who make a mark on a person's life and it subsequently becomes as if it's hypnosis because what we're doing is acting on a belief system. <coughs> and if we think the beliefs, if we believe the belief system, it's real. These people believe they're in a TV studio. They believe that they're taping a program right now. Yet, this is Thursday, isn't it? Last time I checked, yes. So, the real issue is which Thursday? That one I couldn't See, answer. See, if it was last Thursday, they may not have been here. Or there was a particular Thursday that was more comfortable for them than another. And before you know it, it could be last Thursday or Thursday before that. And there was a time, what were you doing last Thursday? It would take me a minute to recall exactly which moment, <laughs> morning, afternoon, or evening. It doesn't matter, this time of night. With my husband. But once you get off into that reality, mm -hmm. and once you believe it, then that's real. One of the things that concerns me about television with, with children, when they're this big, Children have difficulty distinguishing between what's real and what's fantasy because everything's real to them. Their thoughts are real to them. The pictures that they get in their mind are real to them. The dreams that they have are real to them. They haven't learned to distinguish. And these pictures that they see on television are real to them. And so anyway, other than conscious communication, that's what I was talking about initially. Uh, to me, summed up really what this phenomenon of hypnosis is about, plus a lot of other things. We take ourselves for granted. Uh, one of the ways that you can recognize people that have been to my trainings or have been patients of mine, is they do this a lot. <laughs> I was just about to when you started, I knew. Yeah. Yes, I did this in a training this morning with a group. <laughs> yeah, it's a kind of a nice affirmation. Mm -hmm. It reminds you of something. Can you do that? Maybe from here, back up the middle of your sh shoulders, about 159 muscles. I haven't met anyone who can name them yet. 
yet they can do this. Yet they know, never go around giving themselves a pat on the back saying, look what I can do. I can do this. I can walk. I can articulate all of these muscles of the jaw, the throat, the, th the larynx, the vocal cords. I can ingest air and expel it at a precise enough rate, just the right shape to my mouth, to form words that communicate a sound which we've commonly agreed upon to have meanings. That's called language and that's called speaking. All of these things, thank God, we do without having to think about it consciously. And tie your shoes. Mm -hmm. The mere act of walking requires a coordination of over 600 muscles. And if you watch a toddler, and that's the reason they call him a toddler, is because that's what he does, toddle. Uh, he still hasn't learned how to coordinate all those muscles. But once he learns it, it is out of his conscious mind. If we had to stop and think about everything we do consciously, we wouldn't have any time to do anything. A good example is most people can identify with it. When you learn to drive a car, at first you're very aware of the driving mm -hmm. initially and you overcorrect. If we were to go through life having to drive a car like we did when we were first taking lessons, when we first in the car, it would be hectic. And a lot, and what jerky, do, I remember it being very jerky. What we do is we automate it, relegate it to the other than conscious, and then we go ahead and do it without having to give a, even know how we do it. In this area of other than conscious are other parts of our minds where the belief system is. And it's these belief systems I think contemporary psychologists are attempting to um, affect that area of the mind, but I think they're going about it backwards. For example, they're talking about self-esteem. Have you ever seen a self-esteem? How would you build a self-esteem if you can't see one? With great difficulty. That's true. That's true. Very difficult. But by the same token, we act as if it is something. Like self-esteem is something that's real. It's not, it's the result of something. And what it's a result of is the, the essence of the way we feel about ourselves and the way we respond to ourselves and think about ourselves. And um, I think one of the books that made an impact on me years ago was a book called Psycho-Cybernetics. And uh, Dr. Maltz wrote this book. Maltz is a, is a uh, um, plastic surgeon. And what he'd noticed was that people would complain and act in a certain way because they weren't beautiful or they weren't handsome, they had an ugly nose or something. And what he found was that he could build them a beautiful nose so that they're, now they're handsome, now they're beautiful but they still go around not liking themselves. And he's the one that d described a thing called self-image psychology. And for, for a while, I've subscribed to that idea. I thought that made sense, that we carry around this image of ourselves and then live down or up to it, one or the other. Until I began to really appreciate how this mind of ours functions and how we associate ideas and uh, I'm convinced now that we don't have a self-image. What we have is a collage. Remember those things that kids bring mm -hmm. home from kindergarten mm -hmm. and first grade where they take pictures out of magazines and put them in a collage. Yes. And what we have in our mind is a, an imprint of this collage of the way our grandparents treated us, the way our parents treated us, how we, they responded mm -hmm. to us, how we responded to them. And from all this huge collage in our mind, we get a sense of our own self. And then that's what we operate off of. How do you know when to pick the right picture for the right moment? You don't. It's a, nature's an uncritical thing. 
And nature just is nature, and we're a part of nature. I hate to tell people that. I think that there's some people that have an idea that we're above or beyond nature. And I don't believe so. We're a part of nature. And so as a consequence, we absorb everything that's in our environment. When we're very little, we're totally uncritical of the way we absorb information. You remember in the two-week thing that I do, the example I give about a two-year-old, where I say, if I were a crazy parent, an amateur parent, mm -hmm. you know, I'd say, hey, honey, come here and sit in this brown chair. Well, now this chair, oh, I came close this on brown. Let's call brown. it yellow. <laughs> sit in this yellow chair, okay? Now, if you're two years old, you're going to follow the hand movements. You're going to follow my eye movements. And you'll come and you'll crawl in this chair and you get a reward. I say, good girl. You know, and it's a yellow chair. Now, if I have a neurotic wife and we're ganging up on you as amateur parents, we will always, when we see this color, refer to it as yellow. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, this is your world and you grow up and that's yellow. And I have this belief system for how long? Well, when you get into kindergarten, uh, other kids may think that's sort of grayish brown. And you'll argue with them, no, that's yellow. But you begin to spend more hours with your peer group than you do with your parents. And then, of course, on television and books and everything else, they say this color is gray-brown, it's not yellow. 